Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to this week's study. As we continue to examine many of the points that have been presented within Scripture and are being addressed by others within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance to impart to us the wisdom that we need so that we may better and more correctly, properly, divide the word of truth. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are showing us at this time. Help us now, Father. Guide us where you would have us to be. May our minds be opened so that we may examine that which you would want us to consider. May your will be done in this study as your will is done in heaven. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us so that your will is done in our lives and in that which we address so that we may also show your character and your grace to all of those around us. Be with us now. We ask, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Yesterday, we were looking at several points regarding what Eugene Pruitt had published in 2009. Now, Pruitt's points, at least on the surface, would look to be similar to where our points have been. However, Pruitt is very much a critic of anything having to do with the seven times of Leviticus 26. Now, on this page, as we had addressed, as, as Pruitt was using, he was quoting Daniel 12, 6, statement that is made when the scroll is unsealed, when men can finally understand it, they will move accordingly. They will unroll the scroll and hasten up and down it to better be able to study its various parts. Is this where, where Miller would have applied the rushing to and fro when he was coming to understand Bible prophecy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so he gets this right, which he's, he's not going to do like Smith suggests that there might have to do with an increase of other kind of knowledge or to and fro having to do with, uh, you know, people traveling faster. Okay. That it is, it, it definitely is about studying God's word. Okay. But the book is sealed for the time being. Now, when he is using this word sealed, I look at that as being present tense. Do we regard... No, it's not present tense. It was sealed. Okay. But he's saying was sealed for the time being. But the book was sealed, past tense. Okay. I stand corrected. An angel nearby asked the question that Daniel must have been wondering. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Jesus swears in the next verse that it will be at the end or accomplishment of a 1260-day scattering period. This is neither the first nor the last reference to the same period of time in the the scriptures. These 1260-day prophetic days mark the period in which the papacy held the position of successor to Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome as master over the known world. So would we agree that Pruitt is here saying that the 1260-day period from 538 to 1798 is what's being referenced? Yeah, that's what he thinks, which is okay. amazing. Now, I'm not sure how much proof. Like this is 2009. This book was published. Yes, <clears throat> and this movement really started uh, promoting the 2520. You know, by 2005 or so, 2006. Uh, 2005. But, you know, I'm not sure at what. Yeah, so I'm not sure at what point. I mean, we believed it in 2005, but when it, when did it start becoming an issue? that Pruitt would have then responded to, you know, so at the time he wrote this book, he may not even really have addressed the 2520 yet. 
I'm not sure what year he first addressed it because I came to the movement in, in late 2010 and his material was already on the internet then. But it was it was a little softer initially. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, because the issue had not really been agitated that much at that point. So I'm just wondering in 2009, whether he, you know, had his, you know, confrontation, we'll call it, with Jeff over the 2520. I just don't know. Okay. But definitely, you know, many people, even in the movement, when I came into the movement, did not know that the 1260 uh, scattering was the first 1260. Um, for some reason, I'm not sure why, but they hadn't read Miller, I guess, on that point. So generally, people would just talk about the scattering as being the 2520 for northern Israel and the gathering being the 2520 for Judah. When I came into the movement, that's how they were describing it. And there's the scattering that happens with the 1260. And then there's a gathering that happens actually in 1798 with the, the, the other 12, the 1260 of the treading underfoot. At the end of that period, there's a gathering period, and that's the period um, from 1798 to 1844, that's the period that um, the Protestants are going to be tested. And so with the prophetic mirror, we actually end up connecting, I guess you would say, the Protestants are connected to northern Israel as a symbol, right? So the false prophet is connected to the apostate kingdom of northern Israel, but it's still going to be tested because it goes through that period of, of the Reformation. So the Protestants are tested in the gathering. So there is a gathering that happens in 1798. And then uh, Judah has its own sort of scattering and gathering, which is first typified by Babylon, uh, the Babylonian captivity, right? Because they're going to be scattered, scattered and gathered. And so that becomes typical of what happens with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, then in 1844, has its own gathering for Judah. And then God raises up the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which becomes God's denominated people. And since uh, the close of probation in 34 AD, God no longer had a denominated people until uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church came along. So there's that, that process, that uh, 19 years, which happens at the end of, uh, you know, from 1844 to 1863. So, you know, you could say that the, the denominated people exists earlier once they have the sanctuary message and the Sabbath, but it develops in that period. Okay. Pruitt continued. Though the papacy was powerful even in the 4th century, though she converted many pagan tribes in the 5th, it was not until the 6th that she mounted the dragon and that she is pictured as writing in Revelation 17. In other words, not until the 6th century was the papacy in control of a nation. Only then did she become sovereign in the feudal-like system. She became a civil power, allowing her to appear in the empire prophecies of Daniel 7 and 8, when the Pope became as a feudal lord over the Franks in 508. That was the beginning of her existence as a state. She became the world's dominant civil power when she became feudal lord over the city of Rome and of the Eastern Roman Empire in 538. Now, is something being missed here? Well, of course, we, we started talking with Stephen uh, yesterday uh, because looking at how the different views regarding 508 and 538, I mean, right. a number of different views by the pioneers, uh, by Miller, different people had different views, even in the time of Miller, how to determine, you know, what events mark start of the 1290 and the 1335 and what event marks the beginning of the 1260 of papal dominance. So he actually presents something. I, I've never heard this explanation before. 
So the Pope becomes a feudal lord over the Franks in 508. That's going to be marking 508. Uh, that was the beginning of her existence as a state. And then she became the world's dominant civil power. So this he's, he's connecting this um, uh, religious power. Well, he says she became a civil power, allowing her to appear in the empire prophecies, Daniel 7 and 8. So I'm not really sure what he means by that, how, you know, so is he saying that in 508, um, that that's in Daniel 7? Daniel 7 refers to the 1260 from, we generally would say, you know, 538 to 1798. So I'm not really sure how he's looking at that. Now, this being this feudal lord over the city of Rome and of the Eastern Empire in 538, how does how does the papacy become a feudal lord over the Ro Eastern Roman Empire in 538? I think that's a good question. Yeah. So, so I'm not really sure what he means. I mean, he, maybe he's going to explain it. I don't know, but it, it's definitely not anything I've ever heard before. Well, the the point that I was looking at with this is he, in a de facto manner saying that Rome is already a religious power mm -hmm. and now is becoming a civil power, but is tacitly, quietly trying to say that this is now a combination of church and state. Yeah, that, that's what he's saying, which this view actually seems to be a little more in line with Heidi Hikes, to be honest. Right. It, there, there's some similarities, though maybe it's just stated more directly than Hikes does. The other thing, of course, that's absent here is the 666 years of Miller, right, to Mark 508. So Miller right. generally is going to refer to the 660 years, 666 years from the Roman League, yeah, in 158 BC to 508 which I think is an important point. Of course, we now have the 1335 from the first league with the Gibeonites to 158, with that three-year period there being symbolized because there's 666 six, six times two plus three to get 1335. So I think it, it's, it's pretty interesting how that structure of the 1335 and the 666. And then we also have... Uh, the other two periods of 666, the one that connects 597 to 70 AD, and the other one that connects uh, uh, 129 or 128 uh, to 538. So, so obviously he's going to miss out on on those other two 666 periods. But but he he you know we should know about uh, Miller's 666 year period. But that wasn't always fully accepted by everyone, which is right. one of the reasons it wasn't explicitly stated on the 1843 chart. That is, different people had different views about um, how to understand 508 and 538. Even in Miller's day, it wasn't unanimous agreement regarding exactly the events that marks uh, those dates. And I think it's something we do need to nail down and examine. Stephen's going to help us with. Okay. Know he's done a lot of research on it. He's had a lot of questions about it. Okay. In much of this, I can see that Pruitt would be at least somewhat in agreement with Heidi Hikes. And there's there's actually quite a bit that we should look to cover. I mean, having Stephen's assistance in this would be very much a blessing because he has a very detailed eye when it comes to these kind of situations. <clears throat> Pruitt continues, this was her time to rule over God's people, to war against them, to drive them, as it were, into the wilderness. And these ideas, connected with the 1260 days in Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 and Revelation 13, are summarized in Daniel 12:6 as a scattering of the power of God's people. But these things were not understood by the prophet himself. Like the angel, he wanted to know 
when the time would come for the book to be unsealed. And as he had not understood the answer to the question, he asked again, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall the end of? So it shall be the end of these things. Daniel 12, 8. Jesus begins to answer by alluding to the fact that there is a good reason for Daniel's inability to comprehend. The vision is not yet unsealed. Thinking about it will not change this. So Daniel might as well go about his business. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. But this is only the beginning of Jesus' answer. When the time of the end comes, Jesus explains, some will participate in a special work of sanctification. Others will not. And none of the others will be able to understand the book when it is unsealed. Only the wise, sanctified ones will understand. Pruitt continues, quoting Revelation or Daniel 12.10, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and the, none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Daniel had asked about the time of the end, but hadn't yet received any more information about its timing. That information Jesus gave next. When will the time of the end be? And from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, so there's something here that um, that we need to pay attention to, especially when we get to his next paragraph. But uh, just to go back through this, so we know that um, the Daniel's book is closed up and sealed until the time of the end, and then we're going to have this reference to these three steps: purified, made white, and tried that we saw in verse 35 of chapter 11. Right. So try, purge, and make white, I think is the way that it orders it. Um, so purge instead of purified, but it's really meaning the same thing. And we know that this is actually, that there are two times of the ends, which uh, Pruitt doesn't know, right? He doesn't accept that. So we say that this purified, made white, and tried is primarily for our period, the repeat of history, though it does relate also to Netherite history, so that there's a, a parallel there. And then he's already taken the position that the 1260, the time times and a half, ends in 1798 from verse 7. And yet here, he's now given um, a period that's going to end in 1798. And then he's going to be given one in, that ends in 1843, but first one in 1798 in Daniel 12, verse 11. So from the time that the daily shall be taken away in the abomination that maketh set up, maketh desolate being set up. So he's going to be given that 45 year period that's going to be addressed. But it doesn't make sense what he's going to talk about next. Because he's saying that the answer here to when the time of the end is, is being given. And, and maybe we could say that, 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 that there, in some ways, by having the 1290, it helps nail down a little bit more when the time of the end is. But, but I, I don't think that the first 1260 is actually telling us that. Right? So that's why we have this explanation of the 1290. But he's already assuming that the 1260 has been given, but there's not really a reason then why he needs to be given the 1290, if you understand what I'm saying. So to me, to, to talk about the daily first needs to be understood that that's the scattering of the power of the holy people, is the daily. That's paganism. And then the abomination that make it desolate being set up, there's going to be this uh, 1290 and 1335 is going to be addressed. But it doesn't really specifically address the second half of the 2520, where 
Of course, he doesn't believe in the 25-20, but he sees the second half in verse 7. I know that's a bad explanation, but but you understand the problem there. That without the 25-20, he, he doesn't, still doesn't really have the 1260 for Papal Rome here. But, but if we see that the scattering is, is the daily, then we, we have hinted in here the 1260. Because it doesn't explicitly talk about the 30 year period. But then if you've seen that there's a 1290 and it's going to be at the time of the end, then, then the next the 1260 would be implied, right? Because if you understand the 2520, then you would see the 1,290 days as ending after 25, 20 years. You understand what I'm saying? You, it, 538 is here implied if you understand the 2520. So there, there's, no, there's no explanation of what this daily is that's being taken away, how long that daily is, unless you understand that the scattering is the daily. It's paganism that does the scattering of the power of the holy people. Is, is anybody have questions about that? Does that make sense? One of the things that struck me <laughs> when when we considered the graphic representation that Stephen had made that he shared on WhatsApp, mm -hmm. where he was showing the interrelation between the 1290 and 1260. He was using the founding of Rome to 538 as a representation of the time period for the, the, uh, for where 1,290 years had expired. Yeah, so, so 5, 753 BC to 538 AD. Correct. 1290 years. Mm -hmm. So it gives the 1260 from the founding of Rome to 508. Right. Now, it's intriguing because the historical application on the founding of Rome places a date on it on what would have been the Julian calendar of the 21st of April of 753, which on the biblical calendar would have been the 23rd day of the first month. Now, at this point, in looking at this, for the second witness to occur so specifically connected with Rome. I should say the primary witness connected primarily with Rome, and then the second witness connected directly with Rome adds much weight to the validity of the 1290 being a symbol of Roman dominance, first in the pagan and then in the papal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's addressing pagan and papal Rome. In um, so we know that normally we look at the 1260. It's just addressing paganism itself, right? Um, right. And and we normally divide it up. At least Miller does. He's going to start 677. He's going to say there's so many years for for Babylon until Medo Persia, right? And then there's so many years for Medo Persia until uh, Greece, and then there's so many years from Greece until Rome, and he's going to mark the end of Rome as 158. It's always when they come in contact with God's people, and you have 666 years to 508. But now we can see here that Rome itself has another 1290-year period. Um, so th it becomes extremely interesting. Um, just these these various connections. Now the other thing that I and, go ahead. And and it's also timely that Stephen brought it up when he did. He noticed now, all then. the the dates themselves are not in full alignment on the biblical rabbinic and Islamic calendars. I find it interesting that at that time all of the calendars 
are referencing that this founding of Rome took place in a leap year. Okay. This, so, um, so this April 21. Yes, yeah, so April 21. It's here. So you have April, yeah, so 21, April 21 of 753. You have this occurring on the 23rd day of the first month on what we see as a biblical year of 3293. As far as the rabbinic calendar, it'd be the 21st, 24th day of the first month of 3008. And for the Islamic calendar, it would be the 23rd day of the seventh month, 1,416 years before the Islamic calendar was put into use. Yeah, but, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, so the Islamic calendar doesn't actually exist yet at that point. But, um, so the 23rd day of the seventh month, if you go back retroactively. Now, you're, you're making a point about uh, the leap year. Yes. So the Vinic has an embolismic, an embolismic year of 385 days. Um, the biblical has uh, a 384-day year. So, again, uh, a leap year. Now, the leap year on the Islamic calendar, well, they, they sometimes add an extra day just to align it with the solar year, though um, that's not really done by calculation. It's done by observation initially and then later on by calculation, but this is a calculation one. Um, so you're just saying that they're all leap years, and the Julian and Gregorian have a leap year in that year. Okay. So that's what you're saying. They're all leap years. Right. When I'm when I'm looking at the embolismic complete on the rabbinic year at 385 days and the biblical calendar at 13 months, but 384 days, are they not technically leap years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then and then the Gregorian and Julian are leap years. Right. So, so everything is a leap year that can be. OK. So it's just interesting how all of this convergence happens with this day that history says and attests to the founding of Rome. Mm -hmm. So now, do, do we have a specific date for the Jewish League or not? I haven't looked. I don't, I don't think we do. We just have, yeah, you know, whether there's some event that we would mark. Because I also spent some time yesterday looking for specific days in 508 and in 538. And the closest I could come was a victory that Belisarius had over the Ostrogoths, the Eastern Goths. But it only gives a month of March of 538. Yeah, and, and so we need to figure out exactly what what events we're going to mark. I mean, in 508, we have the baptism of Clovis. So we just generally look at that. But, you know, we still haven't decided what all the events are in these various years. Right. So there's there's actually quite a bit here yet chronologically to be considered. So while we while we have been speaking, one of the points that you brought up that, that is quite interesting, of course, this portion of Daniel 12.10, verbally, linguistically, dealing with the purified, made white, does have its connection with Daniel 11.35. But then when we're also looking at this, if we're doing as Father Miller would recommend, we would take a look at the first occurrence. And that actually occurs in 2 Samuel 22, 27. Now, the majority of time that this word occurs, that 
in Daniel eleven thirty five says purge or says made you know purified here, the word is translated as choice. But in Daniel or excuse me, Second Samuel twenty two twenty seven, with the pure thou shalt show thyself pure. So you have two different words. Mm-hmm. One Hebrew two eight eight nine and the second Hebrew one three zero five which, strangely enough, is 30 digits different from 1335. Mm -hmm. So with the pure, thou will shew thyself pure, and with the froward, thou will show thyself unsavory. Is this showing that there is a time of purification in order to become as the wise that we're going to address in Daniel 12, 12. Mm-hmm. Or am I grasping? Daniel 12. Well, yeah. okay. So, yeah. So in Daniel 12, 12, dealing with the 1335. Right. Um, so there's this period of time, the purified, made white, and tried. That's that 45-year period to get to those that are going to receive the blessing. Right. Right. The way that we look at the 1335 is that it actually marks uh, the end of the first angel's message, right? The close of probation for the Protestants. Right. Okay. So that, that's the group that's tested in that 45-year period. And now, so we could say they're going to be purified, made white, and tried. Uh, you know, those are the three angels' messages. But the three angels' messages are all contained within the first angel's message. Right. Your God give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So you can see how those are all tied together. So, so we know that this time at the end, you know, does refer to 1798, but so does the one from chapter 11, verse 35, deal with the Millerite period. And so there's this different order. So to me, it's just speaking more about the repeat of history. Um, so in 35, it says, some of them of understanding shall fall to try them to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And so we're just saying that that time of the end, 1798, and the time appointed there, 1844, right? So it's, it's going to be that period of time. Here it's really the 46 years in verse 35 that's being addressed. And then in chapter 12, that 1290 and 1335 is going to really address the 45 years. The one's going to address just up to the first day of the first month in 1844, where in verse 35 it's really going to be addressing because the time appointed is the Moed, and that's the Day of Atonement in 1844. So so these things overlap, but also there is this parallel to the repeat of history. But we could say, you know, definitely that the purified, made white, and tried does apply to the Protestants in that 45-year period of the first angel's message. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense to people. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, what we notice as we go over this again um, with Pruitt's. You know, every time we examine it, we see something else. Right. Now, it's interesting, too, here in when it says, but the wise shall understand. Now, we, we see the word wise in, in 12 verse 10 is 7919. Right. And when you go back to 1135, you see that number, but it's going to be translated as um, understanding, and some of them of understanding shall fall. But so that means, so when you, when you look at the King James, some of them, some is an added word. Uh, but really, this is saying, I'm not sure why they put some in there. Maybe it's because of the word of, but that word of just means from them, from, from the wise shall fall so obviously so they're just saying well it's some of them from the wise 
So I'm not really sure, you know, how to how to understand that in Hebrew. But that's why you got that four four eight zero. That word of is really the word from. So literally, it's it's from the wise shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white. So it doesn't really make sense in English if you say it that way. That's why they say, and some of them, of the wise, shall fall. And that word fall, um, uh, to totter and waver, right? You know, through weakness of the, the legs, especially the ankles. <laughs> okay. So it means to falter, stumble, faint. Uh, so this isn't uh, really, I mean, it can refer to a moral fall. But I think it's just uh, referring to this, this, because uh, they're going to fall to try them, to purge them, and to make them white. So this is a testing period, right? And then it says, even to the time of the end, that word uh, to, it's just this preposition, which has lots of different meaning. It can mean before, it can mean against, uh, and refer to degree, it can be, uh, you know, far, space, it can be um, uh, toward, until, when, while, yet. You know, so it's got lots of different meanings. Uh, but the idea here is at the time in the end, and then it has that word yet, uh, 5750, oh, which means a continuance or an iteration uh, for a time appointed. So. So that time of the end and the time appointed can, can both apply to the Millerite period and to our period. But the idea is that the time of the end to the time appointed is a period of time in which they're going to be tried, purged, and made white. So, so the parallel here, I, I, I don't know, you know that I've ever seen anyone else make a parallel uh, with 1135 because most people don't apply that to the Millerite period, uh, as we saw with Uriah Smith. The, he doesn't apply this at all to the Millerite period, but it definitely is. Right? Well, what struck me when you're when you're bringing this out, this Hebrew number seven nine one nine. If we rearrange the digits, we come to nineteen ninety seven. Now that being four years before two thousand and one eight years after Elder Jeff first began giving presentations in 1989. So I look and I, I just have to wonder. Now, the other part of that here again, you're in using the rule of first mention, them of understanding the first verse that we would find that had anything to do with this would be Genesis 3.6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, 7919, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So the initial translation is at the fall of man, and yet here in Daniel 11.35, and Daniel 12.10, we are finding those that will become wise, but not in their own eyes. They will become wise according to what God would count as wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Eve was deceived in regard to the idea that eating the tree would make her wise. Right. Um, uh, but, but we see the two classes there. Right, so the whole issue then dealing with, uh, you know, Genesis chapter three, fall of man, uh, and then the everlasting gospel is going to be proclaimed, the seed of the woman, you know, shall bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent should bru shall bruise his heel. Right. Right. Um, her, so I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now, he's talking to the serpent, so the, there's the, the serpent's seed is um, 
the foolish, right? The seed of the woman, that that is, of course, referring to Christ, but also to the wise, right? So the two classes. So it shall bruise thy head, that is, uh, the seed of the woman, Christ, and thou, referring to Lucifer, shall bruise his heel, that is, he's going to bruise the heel of Christ. But Christ, you know, he's, he's crushing the head of the serpent. Now, as he crushes the head of the serpent, the serpent bites his heel, so to speak. So that's the symbol that's given there. But we can see it, it, it does relate to the two classes, the wise and the foolish. So the fact that she thinks it's going to make her wise, eating of this fruit of this tree, it, it still addresses that. And then, of course, the woman, the curse that's going to be upon her is... Um, Women are saved in childbearing, Paul says. So that is the suffering that they experience, not just in conception and bringing forth children in the sense of of birth, uh, but also their dependence upon the husband. And um, so there, there's lots there. The, the, the trials that we go through in life that we often try to avoid, we think of as a curse are actually there to develop character. Now, if we took advantage of these things that God give us, we can gives us, we can develop a Christ-like character. And that's all of the difficulties in life. For Adam, it's going to be um, uh, that he's going to have to work really hard uh, to bring forth food. That things are not going to come easy anymore. The ground's going to be cursed. You know, there's going to be the thorns and the thistles. Now, a comment from the chat dealing with purified, made white, and tried gives a reference that this is three steps of purification in the Laodicean message. Any thoughts on that? Okay, so the three steps in the Laodicean message, um, uh, gold tried in the fire, right? White Correct. raiment, so Correct. Like white in there. So we can see that we got the tried, we got the white raiment, and then the eye salve, um, so that we can see because we're blind, um, which is a type of spiritual discernment. And and definitely we can relate that to the three angels' messages. Um, now, if you're going to say which is which, um, how would how would you align those? How would you align each of those? aspects of the Laodicean message which with each of the aspects of the three angels messages. I mean gold tried in the fire, that seems to be the, the third one, right? It can be, yes. And then white the raiment white raiment being sanctification, yeah, yeah. So right. Mm-hmm. And then your your purification is that in having the pure vision. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So the purification there of the so the ISAP, and the thing about the ISAP that I always see about it is I mean, this is the type of spiritual discernment to see your own sin, right? Which is the first step. Right? The first step is you see yourself as a sinner, you go to Christ, you get justified for your sins. So that's the purification or justification, I guess we would call it. So, yeah, so that's a good insight, good uh, thing to notice about that, that the Laodicean message is actually a three-step testing prophetic message. Right. Now, Pruitt continues here. It is ironic that persons do not catch the connection between verse 11 and verses 8 and 9. So here he's saying, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Verses eight and nine, and I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall the shall, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are being closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So to repeat what he's saying, it's ironic that persons do not catch 
the connection between verse 11 and verses 8 and 9. Without this connect, without the connection, one is left to speculate regarding the event prophesied to take place at the conclusion of the 1290. Verse 11 says nothing about what happens at the close of this period. Yeah, so I mean, now he says this is ironic. What What is ironic is that he thinks it's ironic. I'm not sure what the irony is there, but the thing that, that's interesting, I guess, is that if you don't understand the 2520 and you don't understand that uh, verse 7 of chapter 12 is referring to the scattering, and then you don't recognize then that the daily is is a period of 1260 and that that the daily has to be taken out of the way, in order for the abomination that make it desolate to be set up, and we know that the abomination of desolation being set up has to be at the end of the daily, uh, like the daily is taken out of the way, but yeah, it has to be at the end of that period of 1260 of the scattering, right? So if you know the scattering is 1260, and then you know that the time of the end is when the 1290 ends, then you have you have the whole pieces or more pieces of the puzzle to put it together where you still don't really have it as clearly marked out if you don't recognize those things and, and now that we have the 1290 uh, from uh, 753 BC and we have the 666 years of Miller uh, we, we have so many pieces of the puzzle to put this together. Now, I guess one of the things, you know, that I noticed about uh, this message that that helped me a lot was the 2300 years, there's always been this debate, you know, how do we start it? And of course, this message has given us really clear information uh, to show that it's the 10th day of the seventh month in 457 BC. But we also have the 220 years of the 2520 to connect to the 2300 days, to give that second witness to the 2300 days, to October 22nd, 1844. That is, uh, before within Adventism, we only have the 2300 days that ends on October 22nd, 1844. We don't have the 1335 ending there. Of course, we have it ending in the spring, and we have 187 days to the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So so we do have, have that. But, of course, most people don't know about that. But we, but we also have the 2520. And so that 2520 is the second witness um, with all the different details of it what happens in, in, of course, uh, Millerite history and how it's connected to 457. This gives us a much more solid footing. And in the same way, uh, understanding the 2520 gives us these other witnesses to the 1260 and the 1290 and the 1335 in ways that Adventism has never seen. And, and this is part of the power of this message, I believe, uh, for Seventh-day Adventists. When Seventh-day Adventists begin to examine these types of things that we've put together, I think it'll be very powerful to get people away from the apostate Protestant way of studying and to see the much clearer way of line upon line. Because I think that's the real problem. When when I think about, um, uh, I remember going to the ABC some years ago, you know, maybe ten years ago or more, um, at 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 a camp meeting, uh, at the conference camp meeting in Alberta, and I, and I I just took a quick look through the books on prophecy that they were selling, and all of the books of prophecy pretty much were the scholarly books. That is, when it came to prophecy books for the average person, prophecy became something of a scholarly uh, vocation. It, 
it wasn't for the general Adventist anymore. I, I don't know if people have noticed that. But when you get into prophecy, it becomes now the scholars who write the books on prophecy, such as that guy that uh, was mentioned uh, that Stephen's reading, um, starts with a D, sort of a French name. Can't think of his name. Um, you know, you have these highly intellectual and scholarly books, but for the average Adventist, it's, you know, it's more devotional material. And yet we can see how, you know, like Stephen's chart there of the 1290 years, the Pride of Lake 538, that we can sort of cut through all of that ob obscurity that comes through the scholarly world and present these things in a very simple way that's easy to illustrate, easy for people to see. Um, you know, I'm going to be doing again on Sabbath another presentation uh, dealing with the story of Joseph and connecting that to, uh, you know, Joseph's three years to Christ's 30 years and, and uh, uh, the periods of uh, plenty and famine and, and how that relates to the prophetic periods. You know, when you show this to the average Adventist who may be, you know, they're not that interested in prophecy because of the complexity that's there. In a sense, we, we don't realize what a tool we have to allow people to see things more clearly, right? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of detail there. and We're going to be sending a lot of detail with 508 and 538. But in some ways, you could dispense with a lot of the detail, at least to allow a person to see it clearly. Obviously, once they see the bigger picture, the, the detail becomes easier to discern. It, it now has a more ready context in which to understand it. More thematic, maybe, is another way of looking at it. So much of the current books, as you're pointing out, are written with language the scholars love to use. Yet this is very much the antithesis of the way that Miller and many of the pioneers approached the same subjects. Miller was led to make the subject clear for the common man. Is this not the same way in which Christ presented the concepts of the gospel at his time yeah just a thought on that so um the mess the, the the way of studying for this time we know is line upon line so drawing out these lines right you know, that in order on a line from year to year is an extremely powerful way to present the truths of scripture it, uh, and, and as an analytical tool it's almost indispensable i mean if we had not had this line upon line method and looking at spans of time and, and these connections, there's so much that we would not have been able to readily see and, and especially to show it to others, right? So as a tool to one to analyze, but also to illustrate and, and, and to demonstrate the truths of scripture. It's, it's very, very powerful. Now, the scholar's work is more, uh, to obscure things, almost, you know, uh, you know, read this book, well, I can't read it because I'm not learned, right? And you give it to the learned, well, the learned says, you know, I can't understand it because it's sealed, basically, right? Right. Um, and, and we can see that with Angel Manuel Rodriguez, you know, it's it's like, well, don't speculate too much, play it safe, because the most dangerous thing is just to get something wrong. So it's better to have no opinion uh, and to have a wrong opinion <laughs> in the scholar's view. If that makes sense, I don't know. But that's the way they approach it. So, I mean, part of the reason I think that Adventism has, has gone astray is because of the scholarly understanding taking away from the common person the ability to understand prophecy, that it, it that it's the the purview of the scholar, the expert, and so um, even though we, do, we don't understand what they're saying, uh, we have to accept it as true because we just don't know enough. 
and you know you see this in the area of chronology i mean what Stephen and i have been trying to do is is not just understand the chronology but make it much more accessible uh, to people in the movement right because obviously there are some very technical details uh, that we've had to wade through in sorting through the chronology and Stephen's very good at illustrating that with his diagrams and these spans of time and and, and the charts. And so, if, I mean, if anybody goes through table history, uh, there's some very useful charts there um, for anybody who wants to uh, spend time on chronology that make it much more accessible than anything. When when I first started cr looking at chronology, it was it was a pretty dense field. Um, and we've got rid of a lot of the, the rubbish and cleared it up. And, and I think, you know, we've placed it in, in a box so that people can see it. Right? It can be on display. Now, there's still a lot more work to do, you know, to demystify uh, biblical chronology. That's, you know, that's what we're seeking to do. Now, once in this with, with chronology, because we are, accepting that we are led by Palmoni. As you're saying, dis demystifying chronology, is this not another type of the jewels and having to get rid of the, the shavings and the spurious jewels that have been mixed in with the, the real jewels? Yeah. Well, I sort of think chronology is kind of the box or the framework. I mean, I think of chronology as the backbone of of um, biblical history, right? Of history. With, without chronology, you can't really tie events together. I mean, uh, you know, I've run into people who just say, "Well, we don't need we don't need all this chronology stuff." Well, without the chronology, we wouldn't have the prophetic periods, right? I mean. And, and some people don't like, and one guy says, well, you get all this chronology from secular history, uh, so he doesn't trust it. Well, I mean, how else would we understand 457 or the crucifixion of Christ without looking at history? Right. I mean, right. You, you couldn't discern that from the Bible itself without, you know, seeing how it, it's unfolded in history. But yeah, so there's, you know, getting this so that it's much more accessible, so that we can we can explain it and illustrate it. Um, obviously, the line upon line is extremely powerful. Having these different charts and diagrams um, that Stephen has, uh, you can see that if if this chronology is correct, it produces so many uh, coincidences. You know, use that word in quotation marks that. It, it must be designed that no man could have constructed this chronology. I mean, the fact that, you know, we have, with this chronology, we have the periods of 490 years. We have the periods of 1335 and 1290s that go back into the past. We have um, uh, the 2520 uh, prophetic near, the one that also is the 1764 years. It goes back to the story of Joseph, that you can tie the story of Joseph together. Um, even things dealing with the flood in the 777 years and all of these different things work if you have the correct, correct chronology. If you move it by one year or two years, the whole thing falls apart, right? Like it's, it's so interdependent, this structure of prophetic chronology that even if somebody doesn't know all of the details and can't prove every single point, it's extremely persuasive just on its own as a structure because there is a complexity to it, but yet each of the parts themselves have a simplicity to them that witness to the truthfulness of the complexity, if that makes sense. So you can show these different diagrams that Stephen has and they're all interdependent. They're not, you know, one standing on its own. They all are dependent upon all of the other pieces of the puzzle in order to have significance. And so they all are these, you know, thousands of witnesses to the correctness of the prophetic periods. So 
all of these things witness to the correctness of the 2300 days and the 1260 and the 1335 and the 1290. And it would be very, very difficult, even if somebody doesn't understand all of the niceties of how we arrived at those dates, they would still have to say the fact that these dates produce these structures must be a witness to the correctness of the dates. It's it's not just a simple pattern of jubilee cycles that we created and that you know we make everything fit into. There, it, to me, it's just an amazing structure. Right, and, and that's part of what we're seeking to to have people understand, and and that we will be presenting. I, I believe, you know, to Adventists and then to the world to some degree. I mean, the prophetic periods need to be understood as part of the gospel. I mean, we need to understand that Christ is one who came at the end of the seven, you know, in the seventieth week. He's crucified, and uh, you know, there there are things that need to be understood, but they can be done so much more simply in how we can we can show that over what has generally been done within Adventism. So within Adventism, we have these prophetic periods. All of this criticism comes against them. And, and the reason why there's so much complexity is that we don't have a solid chronology and, and people just attack it from left and right. And so Adventists, the average Adventist, doesn't have the expertise to sort through that. So they just kind of throw up their hands and say, well, you know, I'm just going to trust that our scholars must have it correct. And when our scholars decide that, you know, the 2300 days and the 70 weeks and the 1260 and the 1335 and 1290 aren't based on reality when they decide that, you know, uh, the chronology is all wrong. Well, then Adventism has no foot to stand on. The foundation has been removed. Um, but we can bring that back to people by showing them these structures that are so interdependent that they must be true. These structures are not happenstance. They are not. But they could be. Yeah. No human mind could have devised these things, right? Now, through with God's spirit, we are able to discern them and to find the pieces of these structures and put them together. But if we were to try to uh, assemble such a complex structure without the prophecies of Scripture to create some kind of structure that's going to have all of this interdependence and all of these symbols tied together, it would take a, a, it would take a master computer that, you know, would have to have computing power beyond anything that the universe could provide. I mean, because we're dealing with things that are mathematically impossible uh, to the power of 10 uh, with a probability that's greater than all the particles in the universe. So in order to to manufacture that in order to create something, you would have to have a computing power that's that's greater than that, right? You know, you, you couldn't possibly uh, construct it. I mean, I, I know not everybody really appreciates the astronomical impossibilities of what we have found. Those, those are kind of big numbers. But it's, it's an extremely objective witness when you have a possibility that's, you know, to the power of, you know, 10 to the power of 150 or something, you know, all the particles in the universe are something like 10 to the power of, I can't remember what it is. Uh, it's it's definitely less than 100, quite a bit less. So, yeah, so we have some powerful witness. So, again, the irony is the fact that he thinks it's ironic um, regarding these connections when he doesn't see the other connections. That, that we can see of how solid the, these periods are. Exactly. Now, his next statement, it would not be sensible to say it will be 14 days from the last snow until nothing in particular happens. But if a prominent event has been the theme of conversation and a knowing person says, and from the time of the first snow, it will be 14 days, all would be understood that the prominent event would take place at the conclusion of the 14-day period. 
what has been the theme of the seven verses before verse 11. The book is sealed until the time of the end, verse 4. At the end, men will understand the book, verse 5. And how long will it be to the end, verse 6? The end will be after the 1260 days of scattering, verse 7. Daniel asks again regarding the end, verse 8. The book will be sealed until the time of the end, verse 9. At that point, the wise will understand, verse 10. Emphatically, the topic has been the unsealing of Daniel. Just, just go back here a bit. So, so of course, we know that, that it's a little more complex than what he sees in the sense that he's taking the 1,200 days of scattering as being the time of the end. Right. But actually with the explanation of the 1290 and the 1335, that we can then see the time of the end. Now, I do disagree with him as regard to that Daniel doesn't have understanding until the time of the end, because I actually think that Daniel is made to understand this if we if we go back to chapter 11, verse 14, or, or chapter 10, verse 14, pardon me. Uh, so, so in Daniel, I just got to get here, in 10, verse 14, the whole purpose of this Daniel's last vision is now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For, the, for yet the vision, the chazon, is for many days. So he is being made to understand that. And if you're saying that he wasn't made to understand that, then that would be contradicting the whole purpose of this vision. Right. Now, so when he isn't understanding after the scattering, it's because he hasn't he hasn't put that together yet with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. Now, and then what the angel is going to tell him is that, okay, I've shown you all this now. There's going to be this time of the end. And at that time, other people will understand what I just showed you but they won't understand it until then, right? It's not saying that you're not going to understand it, which is what uh, Eugene Pruitt is says. Um, You know, to sort of say, well, go thy way, you know, you're just going to have to wait until the time in the end, you're going to have to rest. And at the end, you're going to understand it. He's already given him the understanding of it. And he says, now you can rest, right? You understand it now, okay? Right. Um, and and then, but you're going to stand in your lot at the end of the days. That is, the purpose of, of your prophecy is going to be understood at the time of the end, right? So, so I don't agree with him that Daniel doesn't understand it at that point, that his understanding is still sealed up. He's going to seal the book up until the time of the end, right? It's going to be sealed. But he understands it. Otherwise, the Bible's contradicting itself. The angel wasn't able to make him understand it. Right. Now, this last paragraph. Emphatically, the topic has been the unsealing of Daniel's prophecies at the time of the end. So when our Lord Jesus says, and from the taking away of the daily... It will be 1,290 days. We ought to understand that this is a second way to arrive at the date of the time of the end. In this situation, the way that he is approaching this in this paragraph, he wants the focus to be strictly at what he sees as being the end of the time, not understanding that this is the beginning of the time of the end. And ignoring yeah. the other part of the subject of the taking away of the daily, because he does not wish to affix a time of the daily's prominence within history. So this paragraph will begin the discussion 
for tomorrow. Now, do we have any other thoughts or questions at this time? Uh, just a question. Sure. So, so we're going to go through uh, Eugene Pruitt's uh, uh, the rest of this article or chapter, and then what is what is the plan further? I mean, at some point we want to look at five hundred eight and five thirty eight in detail, which would be Stephen. Um, getting that information together for us, whether he presents it or whatever, I don't know, and how we're going to do that. And then I do think we do, we, we need to go back over Uriah Smith's articles, starting at chapter 10 uh, at some point, um, and just go through a, a review of chapter 10, 11, and 12. Uh, not too detailed, hopefully. <laughs> well, but, uh, at, at this at this point, Chapters 10 and 11 are prepared. So the, the situation, I'm, I will be more than happy to, you know, address a lot of this or to allow Stephen to address what he finds about this with 508 and 538. Mm -hmm. There's only, there, there's a couple of other pages regarding this from this book that I thought were key to being examined because it's interesting how many other theologians and evangelists within the Adventist church right now are placing the 1290 and the 1335 as being some future event. And I'm speaking you know, substantially into the future. Yeah, as day for a day. Right. Which, again, I pointed out, we, 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 when we look and analyze uh, events and we use, you know, 1335 or 1533 or 1290 or 1260, we're not making an application of a prophecy, you know, taking that that 1260 is now being fulfilled in our time. It's just simply a symbol that exists within a structure that, that has ha unfolded or is unfolding. Right. You know, so like, for instance, the, uh, that date in September 23rd, 2017, that the evangelicals, you know, had the Revelation 12 sign. Then they say, oh, from that date, there's going to be 1260 days to the rapture. Right. So they're making an application of the 1260 from Revelation chapter 12 as a literal day for a day prophecy. Of course, that prophecy failed. Um, so we're not doing that, but Adventists are, right? They right. are doing what the evangelicals do. And, and the nice thing about this message is that we're founded upon these prophecies being fulfilled in the past, and they becoming symbols for what has what is unfolding in the present. So they're they're light for our feet, but we're not using them to predict events. You right. Know, we're not. We measured 1,260 days from July 18th to when Jeff spoke for the first time, right? That, that's not a fulfillment of the 1260. It's just a symbol is there of the symbolic use of numbers that are rejected 1,260 days after July 18th, you know, verbally by Jeff. Okay. So we're now over our time for today. Any other thoughts or comments? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the conversation today and for this time where we may come to a clearer understanding of what you would have us to know. We ask for your blessing today, for your guidance and your direction. May your will be done. May things become clearer to us. Help us now as we go through this day that we may be guided in all things that you would seek for us to do so that your character and your name may be glorified. Help us to this end, we ask, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.